Within sociology, it's generally accepted that gender is a socially learned behaviour. The most prominent theoretical perspective is that we're socialised into gender roles from an early age. From the time we're born, we're placed into gendered categories and treated accordingly. Girls are dressed in pink and given dolls, and they're encouraged, sometimes by their parents but often by the media, to engage in princess or domestic play. All of these activities are designed to guide girls into a preoccupation with appearance, domestic duties, and an emotional or material reliance on men. On the other hand, boys are dressed in blue and they're given toys that reflect violent or practical career-based play. Of course, the reality of child rearing and parenting isn't often that reductive, and it's unlikely that people's parental decision-making in these areas is so deliberate. But the way we guide young girls towards being concerned with their appearance rather than their academics has implications for the ways that they are perceived and treated in society. It's important to be critically aware of the messages that we send and receive, because it's these unspoken messages that shape our attitudes and beliefs. So how do sociologists believe that this functions? In the 1950s, Talcott Parsons devised a three-tiered model of how socialisation occurs. Within the primary environment, which refers to the home, infants and children learn from their family. They observe the gender dynamics between their parents, their grandparents, aunts and uncles. They may learn from the ways in which they are treated differently from their other gender siblings or cousins. Through this observation, children internalise an idea about what normal people do. In the secondary environment, young people start viewing gender dynamics that go beyond their immediate family and into formal institutional settings, such as childcare centres and schools. They absorb how boys and girls are treated differently by teachers and staff, how boys and girls are grouped separately, and how they're expected to behave. They also learn from observing people who deviate from normative expectations and the consequences they face, such as bullying or other forms of punishment. Finally, in the tertiary environment, young people look to broader society for cues on how gendered behaviour ought to be performed. They take cues from peers and strangers, from workplaces, from social norms and stereotypes. They look to the media for role models, celebrities and cult figures and trends for ideas about what an ideal man or woman looks like and what they ought to do. Looking at the tertiary stage, we can see that gender socialisation doesn't just stop after adolescence. It's a process that continues well into adulthood. Notice the kinds of traits and behaviours that are stereotypically masculine and feminine, and how they relate to the kind of toys marketed specifically to girls and boys, and the behaviours that they're encouraged to display. Boys are generally socialised to be assertive, aggressive and competitive, and they're provided with opportunities, through toys and schooling for example, that allow them to develop the skills required for practical, hands-on careers and leadership positions. Meanwhile, girls are socialised to be passive and nurturing, and often guided towards careers within caring professions, or away from careers with long-term commitment required in, and progression opportunities due to expectations around having children. The fields that men and women tend to be respectively concentrated within have disparate rates of power, influence, and importantly, wages. To explain this, Australian sociologist Raywin Connell developed the concept of hegemonic masculinity, which she defines as the configuration of gender practice which guarantees, or is taken to guarantee, the dominant position of men and the subordination of women. What this means is that there is a prescriptive way to be a man that functions to ensure that adherence to masculinity provides men with access to the traits and characteristics that allow them to maintain an unequal share of influence, power, status and economic capital. Hegemonic masculinity functions to ensure the disproportionate representation of men in highly paid leadership roles, both in the workforce and in politics. This happens because the qualities required to succeed in those areas, such as aggressiveness, ruthlessness, detachment from emotion, and working out of the home, are all encouraged in boys and often punished in girls because they're seen as not feminine or ladylike. Men's and women's roles in society have changed dramatically during the 20th century, adapting as society and the economy have changed. Strict traditional views of gender roles were challenged following the Second World War out of economic necessity. 
women were required to work in factories and other industries due to a workforce shortage caused by conscription. Once men returned from the war, many were unable to fulfil the obligations of their pre-war jobs, and women's involvement in the workforce slowly started to become accepted. Since then, participation in the workforce and in politics for both men and women has become commonplace, and even a necessity for some. Economic reasons for this include an evolving labour market that trends towards white-collar work, that is, more professional, clerical and administrative management jobs that are less concerned with gendered tasks and responsibilities, and the declining availability of full-time work and high casualisation, which means that more women have been able to balance commitments to raising children while participating in the workforce part-time. Further economic reasons include the rising cost of living, which is making it less feasible to only have a single wage earner in the family while still enjoying a decent standard of living. Social and political movements have contributed to this shift too. Feminist movements that have long sought equality for women in the workplace and in society have made significant contributions to changing our views on gender roles. Women's suffrage, or the right to vote, was a primary concern of the first wave of feminism during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Following this, the second wave of feminism, which began in the 1960s, was concerned with the right to access no-fault divorce, birth control and family planning options. This has allowed women to choose to start their families on their own terms by providing the ability to prioritise work and family commitments. In summary, masculinity and femininity and their associated gender roles are socially constructed concepts that have a significant influence on how we're expected to look and behave and can have a significant impact on the career and personal trajectories of our lives. This is why sex and gender is such an important focus of sociology. Once we've unpacked the key differences between sex and gender, we can really start to scrutinise the social and cultural norms that dictate our behaviours based on which category that we're placed into. In the Western context, much of our social world is gendered in the sense that most of what we see and do is categorised as either being masculine or feminine. This is why some sociologists are so interested in studying sex and gender, because they're such taken-for-granted social realities. As a society, our common consensus on what constitutes masculinity and femininity can reveal some interesting insights into how men and women are treated differently, and how they can have disproportionate experiences of certain advantages and disadvantages. These commonly accepted sets of attributes are gender stereotypes, which require sociological critique. Someone who is stereotypically masculine could be described as strong, protective, assertive and competitive. At the same time, he is intellectually rational, logical and well suited for intellectually challenging work. He is stoic and he doesn't express certain emotions, rather suffering than asking for help. A stereotypical man doesn't spend much time worrying about his appearance, and he has a high libido, often preoccupied with sex rather than romantic love and attachment. Somebody who's considered stereotypically feminine expresses traits that are virtually the opposite of those. A stereotypical woman is soft, understanding, caring and nurturing. She is in touch with her emotions, which might make her irrational at times, and not suited to leadership roles or practical activities. She is preoccupied with appearance and aesthetics, and is largely asexual, more concerned with romantic love and showing affection than in sex and sexuality. Obviously, those descriptions of men and women can be considered pretty offensive. After all, nobody likes to be reduced to a set of specific traits. The interesting thing is that nobody really fits either stereotype, but they're still the dominant traits that we assign to people based on what we perceive their gender to be. But why is that? To most people, these gender characteristics seem natural and people tend to eagerly strive to match them, even when they might not feel entirely comfortable doing so. We often fall into the trap of seeing the male-female gender binary as being an example of natural complementarity. We see patterns in the world around us, such as night and day, light and dark, positive and negative, and we can make the mistake of assuming that men and women fit into this pattern too, because of the way that their seemingly natural personality traits and anatomy all fit together neatly. Again, this reflects a strict functionalist perspective of gender. While there are some sociobiologists who believe that gendered traits such as temperament, 
intellectual abilities, and interests are biologically determined, most sociologists agree that this is a limiting perspective that's used to justify sexism and other types of discrimination and inequalities based on gender and sexuality.